Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. I am excited today to introduce to you Dr. Moochie. She has the coolest Instagram page that you're ever going to want to watch. So her page is linked in the show notes. And we are going to discuss frailty today, which until I ran into her, I didn't even know it was an actual medical thing. So thank you for joining me. Hello. Hi. So I just thought frailty meant, you know, I'm not even sure I have a very good definition of frailty. I just thought it meant that you started losing the ability to move freely. And then you've told me that there's actual stages and it's a medical thing. So. Why don't you start by telling everybody what frailty actually is to a medical doctor? All right. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Jen. Thank you. And uh, so frailty is very uh, commonly used amongst the families who look after older people. And they just say, oh, mom is a bit frail and uh, she slowed down a little bit. But of course, the term frailty in medical world means completely different thing. And uh, the definition, official definition is frailty is the reduced physiological reserves or lack of physiological reserves. What this means and why is it important to understand? Well, this happens as a result of amalgamation of three major factors. As a result of aging process, amalgamated with age-related diseases we accumulate over the lifespan, as well as side effects of the medications. Let me give you an example what this means. So a recent example from my clinical practice, Uh, Beatrice is a 92-year-old lady. She is quite fit and well, living independently. She, before the lockdown, actually was running classes in a swimming pool uh, pool for senior citizens. So very engaged with her community and living a beautiful life with a good quality of life. However, Beatrice is 92. And in the last two, three years, she did have a few medical problems. She's been to stroke clinic with a couple of uh, mini strokes. She was diagnosed with angina. She also has a little bit of high blood pressure, uh, some kidney disease, number of problems. None of them are actually bad enough to impact on her day-to-day functioning. She takes medicines for these conditions. She is on blood thinners for the mini strokes. She is on cholesterol tablets. So she's functioning well. And then one day, she develops really bad kidney infection or urinary tract infection. And it was bad enough for her to be hospitalized in hospital. And what happened? She became very confused, delirious. And rather than spending just two, three days in hospital um, for intravenous antibiotics, she had two weeks admission in hospital because her confusion wasn't resolving. And of course, what happens to all the adults if they spend a lot of time in in bed? She completely deconditioned. Her muscles wasted away. By the end of her hospital admission, this keen swimmer could not stand. She had to go into a rehabilitation facility. And it was good two months before she actually returned home. And she was not back to her normal self. She required carer's assistance. She required her family to help her. And that's what frailty is. It's an amalgamation. She did not know that she is frail. Her family did not understand why mom so fit and well, swimming the day before, teaching her class, next day hallucinating and actually swearing, which mom never did before in her confused state, why this was happening to her. It was very traumatic for the family. And that's what I said. I explained frailty because of course as a result of her previous mini strokes she had reduced brain reserves and urinary infection it's an infection there are toxins in the body which are poison in the brain now in you and i we might not have a major problem but beatrice 
had strokes before. So her brain reserves were low and she developed acute confusion. She is 92, age-related changes to the body mass and muscles. Do you know, um, uh, uh, Jen, that after the age of 50, we lose about 1% to 2% of muscle mass every year? So yep. just imagine when you come to 92, remember, she's actually a swimmer. She wasn't bad. Um, but you can't go against the nature. So there you go. Mini strokes causing reduced brain reserves. She's a 92-year-old with reduction in her muscle mass, spending two weeks on hospital bed, a little bit of kidney problem on the background. And of course, urinary tract infection led to deterioration of that. And we have a completely different individual at the end of it. And that's what frailty is. So it's the compound effect of life and illness all coming together in a negative way. Yeah, and making you making you um, very vulnerable, making you very vulnerable. And it's not until an acute medical problem comes along, such as urinary infection or maybe heart attack. In some individuals, it just could be even the vaccination sometimes can precipitate that. All depends on how vulnerable you are, what your background is like. Um, and let's not forget the side effect of medications as well. So as I said, it's an amalgamation of age-related changes, disease-related changes, as well as our um, uh, constant exposure to side effect of medications were taken for these diseases. So she was on blood thinners, of course. Uh, you know, she was on cholesterol tablets, and guess what? She was given antibiotic, which interacted with cholesterol tablets, statins, and that made her muscle problems even worse. Yes. One thing leading to another. That always amazes me when I hear a doctor talk about that. My dad was on 25 different prescriptions, and I just shook my head like, they don't even know what these are all how these are all interacting with each other. Oh, you reminded me of a story, Jen, when I had a very compliant uh, lady in her late 80s. She came to my clinic and uh, she said, doctor, uh, my uh, general practitioner told me to take my medicines one hour apart so they don't interact between each other. And, um, but doctor, there aren't that many hours in a day. I'm on 32 medicines. What shall I do, doctor? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you can imagine she left my clinic with just a third of those medicines. I stopped most of them anyway. That's good. Cause I seriously think people rely on a medication instead of lifestyle changes, which kind of brings me back to the frailty. You said there are ways of avoiding it, preventing it somewhat anyway. Do we mm -hmm. want to talk about the different stages of frailty or how to avoid it first? I'm not sure which is most logical. Well, now that we've started talking about Beatrice, I will talk about the stages of frailty so people that are caregivers can recognize these stages and can prepare themselves on how bad things will become when mom does develop that urinary tract infection. And may I refer to what we universally use in medical world, we call it Rockwood Frailty Score. Um, it has pictures on it, and we use it on daily basis, but it is very easy to use even for family members, for caregivers in um, care facilities. And if you look at the pictures, if, if you can include the picture um, so with this podcast, Jen, then people can see that there are nine stages Stage one, two, and three is when people might have minor problems, but they're absolutely fine. Stage four is when there is a little bit of uh, the problems now causing some impact on the quality of life of the individual, and they um, require maybe some minor help with the activities of daily living. We call it pre-frail or really mild frailty. The stage five, six is when the frailty is setting in and uh, the individual is requiring carer support, family support, support with activities of daily living and uh, maybe a help with washing and dressing. 
And at that stage, um, the individual is very vulnerable indeed. It is very easy from stage five and six or on frailty scale to go deteriorate so fast that the individual has to go into a a nursing home, for example, and they are unable to return home. And medically, it is the stage four, five, six, where we need to, in a way, catch these individuals, do our interventions as geriatricians, as a physiotherapist, occupational therapist, try to get them one step up like get that individual from stage five into four, maintain their independence for longer. However, stage seven or eight or nine is when their frailty is irreversible. And here's the message for caregivers. They have to be realistic. If your loved one is already having stage seven, eight or nine, on the frailty uh, score, and these are individuals who are not walking, they're either wheelchair bound or bed bound, requiring care around the clock, can do very little for themselves. These individuals have such a low physiological reserves, they don't need much. A tiny little chest infection would be enough to lead to such a deterioration in their health that it probably will be pushing them into the last stages of their life, into end-of-life st- uh, stages of their life. And we have to plan accordingly at these stages. If we don't recognize it, if we have the unrealistic expectation that everything can be um, back to normal, then we will have the individual suffering in the middle. Unnecessary investigations, unnecessary hospitalizations, unnecessary treatments, And at the end of the day, sometimes it's our guilt which is pushing us to do these things for our loved ones. But at the end of the day, we have this individual suffering. I completely agree. And one of the reasons I became interested in this topic, one was everybody knows that my mom fell and broke her leg. And that was the last straw for her. Her body just couldn't take anymore. But not long after my mom passed, my grandmother, who is 102, she's almost 103, who is mostly blind from glaucoma and very hard of hearing in the last almost two years, she went from being able to function on her own at home, although she should not have been living on her own, to, like you said, being hospitalized. And then she was in a, that wasn't respite, a um, rehabilitation facility. For a short time, I'm not sure what the reasoning for taking her out was, but now she has to live in a care home. And it's just like you said, she needs help up and down out of the chair. She can walk a little bit with a walker or braces. I think you guys know you don't call them braces. Those are suspenders. And she can do very little for herself. And I was kind of shocked that she went from reasonably okay, especially for 102, to not okay, like it's seemingly overnight. Now she's not on very many medications at all, like very low dose blood pressure medication, drops for her eyes. I mean, for somebody in her advanced age, she's on very few medications. So how in your, I mean, obviously you've never met her or seen her, but what do you suspect happened that she just had like underlying issues or was it the lack of visual stimulation and audio stimulation that just, I'm trying to figure out what compounded with her to where she ended up in the state that she's in now. Well, it's uh, amalgamation of everything, Jen. Uh, I think the rapid decline you observed is exactly what it was. She had no reserves whatsoever, no physiological reserves left in her to fight anything. And in patients like her, um, you really, as I said, you really don't need much. And a, a, a few days of constipation sometimes is enough for them just to be uh, going down from an independent individual or functioning okay-ish into a total uh, state of dependency. Just a few days, couple of days of constipation is enough. And that's because oh. there are no reserves to fight anything. And um, we see that all the time. With we, In fact, Jen, I have to say, for these type of patients, 
they actually survive longer if we avoid hospitalizations. What I observe in my clinical practice as a geriatrician, the families get concerned. Mom was doing all right yesterday. Today, she can't walk. She's confused. Let's take her to hospital. And guess what happens in hospital? They get even more confused on a busy medical ward with confused patients shouting, screaming, lights on and off, different faces. People come on different schedules and shifts. Their confusion gets even worse. Um, And if there is a slightest chance for these people to recover from those acute episodes, it is in their own environment, surrounded by the lovely care of their sons, daughters, carers, wherever they are. Their own environment is the best place for them. And I'd say when you are on that Rockwood frailty score scale, um, if you are seven, eight, or nine, the hospital is the last place you need to take your loved one to. So that's the kind of information that we all need because we're trained, for lack of a better term, that there is an physical, medical type emergency, rush them to the doctor or rush them to the hospital. And for many of us, those of us that aren't 102, almost 103, that might be the right choice. But with my dad, I knew it wasn't the right choice. Although he ended up in the hospital for 32 days because once they're there, it's kind of hard to extract them, at least over here in the United States until the problem is fixed. Well, my dad's problem wasn't going to get fixed. Mm. And this, you know, obviously the same thing with my grandmother, you know, she's 102. You ain't going to fix 102. Mm. That's a lot. I mean, I'm 54. What a hospital is going to do for her, apart from making her confused and giving her a hospital acquired infection from which she (laughs) might never recover. Um, You reminded me of another case I actually managed today, Jen. And that's a patient with dementia. Um, let's call him Derek. So Derek is actually a young dementia patient. He he is in his early 70s. And I've known him for five years. I I diagnosed his dementia. I've been looking after him all these five years. And in the last couple of years, dementia deteriorated significantly. Um, His lovely wife, who cared for him all this time, she couldn't do it anymore. Uh, So he is now in a care home. And about eight weeks ago, she asked me to visit him because he deteriorated further. And at that stage, we agreed that really something will come his way. There will be an acute problem of some sort at some stage, whether it's a heart attack or stroke, whatever. And we decided that if that day comes, There is nothing hospital can do to improve his quality of life, to turn the clock around. He is in the last stages of his dementia, even though he is completely mobile, still eating and drinking, but cognitively very bad dementia. We made a decision not for hospital transfers and to keep him comfortable. And guess what? She called me today uh, in tears saying Mm -hmm. that his uh, care home is calling for an ambulance to transfer him to hospital, he has been having recurrent seizures. So that's a problem. You see, you never know what will come your way. Uh, in his case, it's seizures. He, ha- he has been having falls. He banged his head. He's having seizures. And the care home is calling for an ambulance. She's in panic, of course. Um, and I spent whole afternoon coordinating his care, calling his primary care physician, and really honestly putting everyone on spot and saying, well, what am I going to do for him in hospital? Even if he had a fall, even if he had a bleed on the brain or he had a stroke or for whatever reason he's having seizures, I won't find a neurosurgeon to operate on him. It's not in his best interest. Confusion will make him more confused. Hospital will make him more confused. Let's keep him comfortable. His time has come. That's what the wife wanted. That's what we agreed eight weeks ago. Let's stop this panic. And it it was a huge effort. And I can see why people end up in hospital. It it took two or three hours of my time coordinating his care amongst many healthcare professionals. It shouldn't be this difficult. We made these decisions eight weeks ago. Yet, when the time has come, care home panicked. Mm -hmm. And we're dialing for an ambulance. So we have that... 
issue out there where we have to work with our care homes, nursing homes, healthcare providers, educating about frailty, doing care plans to avoid this unnecessary traumatizing of the individual. Yeah, and the family, because that's what happened with my dad. If I had known he had a donated kidney and he didn't take good care of it, and we showed up at their home to put up holiday decorations and spend time with them, this was um, November 29th, 2016. Had I known what was going on with him and had I had enough foresight to know who to call. I would have called hospice that day, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know what was wrong with him. I had to deal with him and mom and their dog. And it was just, it was the most stressful, horrible thing. And he was in the hospital for 32 days. His uh, nephrologist, which for those, those of you who are not doctors, that's a kidney doctor. She kept saying, Once we get enough dialysis, it'll clear up the toxins out of his system and his memory should get better because he went from being what I thought was mentally okay to thinking it was 1998. I've looked back now and saw that there were signs that his cognition was not great. It's not as good as I thought, but compared to my mom, like everybody's better. So or at the time, everybody was better. He was in the hospital for 32 days. He ended up with delirium. When he was released, he knew he had a gap in his memory. He was very anxious to fill that gap. My sister was very super positive, which is her personality. My personality is like, yeah, let's see how long this lasts. Unfortunately, my negative attitude was the right one because after three days, he had no clue He was fighting with the caregivers. He didn't need help, didn't understand why they were there. Then he fell. He ended up in a different hospital, mostly because I didn't want him going back to the first one. And that's when we discussed hospice. But Hmm. it was just, and to back up half a step, his personal nephrologist told me I was going to have to sit, I was going to have to transport him back and forth to dialysis. And I was going to have to sit with him every single time because he kept trying to pull out the needles. And when Mm. I looked at her and I said, you know, this isn't what he wants. This is against his medical directive. I said, I think we need to call hospice. And she hung up on me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm (laughs) sorry to hear that. And here you raised another important issue. And that's the work we have to do between geriatricians and palliative care physicians and single organ specialists. And I spend a lot of time explaining to my patients and families that um, although things are getting better, but if you are looked after by a, a cardiologist, heart doctor, or lung doctor, or kidney doctor, they are mainly looking at their specialism and they are obsessed about the kidney or the heart and they give the medicines and very rarely they actually look at other medications or think about their frailty and long-term prognosis and things like that. And I, I think joint care, by no means I'm saying let's dismiss all the single organ specialists in frail people. Absolutely not. I work very closely with my other colleagues but we need to work together. And there is plenty of evidence out there whilst we're doing active care for someone who is really frail and we don't know whether they will be, which direction they will be going. There is no harm in involving palliative care teams earlier and controlling whatever symptoms we have as well as carrying on with active treatments. And if they don't work, at least their family has already been given some realistic expectations. The palliative care team is there already and uh, the transition of care can be very smooth rather than that's it, we're not going to do dialysis anymore, go and do whatever you want. Um, And that's that's an important issue. You see, um, in understanding frailty, Jen, if families can see that your loved one is stage six, seven, eight, you need to understand that the reserves are running low, that the next chest infection might lead to a dramatic decline. Why don't we discuss that possible decline now? What we're going to do for mom? 
what are our contingency plans? Rather than having a knee-jerk reaction and calling for an ambulance and shifting them to the nearby hospital, let's work our contingency plans where we can involve here in Britain, in United Kingdom, we have crisis response team, for example. These are senior nurses who go into people's houses and administer intravenous antibiotics. So we do that here. We can give treatments at home. There, so there needs to be a clear plan. Treatments can be administered at home. Um, the family needs to think of a, uh, maybe whether it's going to be family members or carers or maybe a nearby care home facility, anything to avoid the transfer to hospital. And also the contingency plan should go further. And what if mom doesn't respond? What is going to be the next step? Is she going to stay in that care home or are we going to organize a large package and she's going to stay at home? So planning, planning, planning. If they are on that stage six, seven, eight, the planning needs to be started now. Definitely. And, you know, planning ahead, a lot of people don't want to discuss our end. You know, we don't want to talk about dying. I know in the United States, and I'm sure Britain is the same, we kind of feel like, Dying is sort of a failure, which is dumb because mm. as my mm. maternal grandfather always said, nobody gets out of this life alive. And then he usually had some quippy statement relating to the conversation. But, you know, we don't get out of this life alive. So if you plan ahead and you say, this is how I want the end to be, this is like, I knew my dad didn't want to be on dialysis. So if he had just told me, I think I'm at the stage where I might be needing it again. So mm. we could have called hospice then, or if I had known about palliative care, you know, six, seven months prior, I could have said, I think you need to have palliative care just so that, you know, to manage whatever is going to happen. And then when the time comes, we'll do hospice. And then in, we wouldn't have spent 32 days in a panic, 32 mm. days where my poor mom went from her home to my sister's home to my home, back to her home. I mean, even the dog was getting anxiety. I mean, it was just horrible. It was horrible for mm. everybody. And, you know, I want you to think about it. The last month that he was not on hospice was horrible. Mm. Does anybody mm. want horrible? No, we don't want horrible. So plan, plan, plan. I am a planner. 2020 was really, really hard because I couldn't plan anything. <laughs> but we still did our trust and our medical advanced directives. And you know what? It's done. I don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Our Rotary Club was talking about those exact types of plans at yesterday's meeting. And I'm like, huh, I'm all done with it. I'm so good. And it made me feel really good because I'm like, we're, we've got it all planned out. So it reduces anxiety to know that you have a plan in place. So when Something scary happens and your immediate reaction is, ah, <laughs> you can take a step back and take a deep breath and go, wait, we discussed this. We planned it. Might want to even write it down or tell your best friend so that they can grab you by the back of the shirt and say, no, this is what you guys planned on doing. This is what you're going to do. I'm holding you to it. You asked me to hold you to it. Yeah. So it's not a failure planning ahead reduces anxiety and stress and scary stuff. So this, how do we prevent getting into those later stages? Oh, I'm, my I'm 54. favorite subject. I, I, did <laughs> my my favorite. I did my weights today, so I'm good. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, um, now that we know definition of frailty and we have an understanding of um, one part of it was age-related changes to the body, which we can't do much about. Uh, the muscle mass will go down, the bone density will go down, kidney, yeah, all these things are happening. So the key is, Jan, is healthy lifestyle, because whereas we cannot avoid age-related changes to the body, what we can avoid is damaging our body with other things. So when we get into our 70s, we have good reserves good enough to withstand the problem. So let me give you a few good examples of how we can prevent things and how we can get into our 70s and age 80s strong enough not to have these major complications and accelerated frailty where one day you live at home, next day you are in a care home facility. Um, 
lifelong exercise has shown to slow down the reduction in muscle mass. And if our listeners are thinking of a present for their older loved ones, please get them a pair of dumbbells, just a two kilogram or four kilogram dumbbells to train their upper body, you know, the strength training. Um, Of course, we are in the middle of a pandemic and there has been abrupt stop to exercise classes to our older people getting out there, having their community walks together and things like that. We don't have any of that, but that shouldn't stop us. Uh, There are many other ways of exercising. We can do the dumbbells. We can do just, I say, walk, walk in your own flat. I instruct my patients on every hour, stand up and walk for five, 10 minutes. And that leads me to the next advice. As we grow older, we feel, well, I'm retiring now. I can slow down. No, you cannot slow down. That's the last thing you want to do because... As you are older, your muscles are, um, you are losing your muscles faster. So in fact, when you are an older person, you need to move even more. Do your walks, uh, subscribe to the gym, uh, do your exercises. Also, our um, families and our children, they are so helpful. They want to do everything for us. No, 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 mom, I'll do that for you. I'll get your shot. No, don't allow them. If you are able, do not Allow them to do anything for you. Do not go into that lazy state. As long as you can do your own things, do it. I heard on the radio a really nice program of this grandma recycling herself, Jen. I laughed at that story. Her own grandchildren now grown up. And she put an advert in the local cafe saying that I'm looking for a grandchild. Everyone thought it was a joke, but it, it, it's a small village where everyone know each other. And this working mom found her and said, can you spend nice time with my daughter after school? And so she, this grandma was saying, I'm recycling myself uh, as a grandma. Why not? Going the, with this 10-year-old after school, collecting her, going for walks, doing things. So that's a major thing. Do not slow down. Okay? Do things. So exercise. Yeah. Uh, the next thing is vitamin D. So throughout our adult life, we need to make sure that we always have enough vitamin D. Vitamin D, um, it stops us falling, breaking bones. Mm. It makes our muscles stronger as well. So especially in the areas where you are at risk, if you are already in care home facility and don't see much sun, or if you are in United Kingdom where there is very little sun, especially in winter, you need to be on supplements and um, contact your GP, maybe have the levels done. So vitamin D. Um, what else do we have? High protein diet in all the citizens have shown to um, reduce the loss of muscle. So it, whether it's going to be pro- protein shakes or high protein diets or supplements, so try to increase the protein in the diet. Um, what else? Obesity, of course. Try to lose weight, even overweight. They, it's all to do with the proportion. If the... Um, We need to remember with aging, fat is trying to take over muscle as it is, as an aging process. But if we are aging already overweight, proportionally, we are having more fat than the muscle. There will be very little muscle to carry us around in our 80s, 90s. So if you are in your 40s, 50s, 60s now, try to lose that weight and do your dumbbells and build up the muscle. So... If you have enough muscle bulk and you get into your 70s and 80s and start losing your muscles physiologically, then you have, in a way, enough reserves to lose, if that makes sense. It does. So these are the main interventions. Good nutrition with high protein, vitamin D, exercise, exercise. Do not slow down in retirement. Well, two things. I love the recycled grandma because (laughs) that benefits her, the child, the mom. Yeah. And it also gives her a purpose in life, which is important for brain health. 
Yeah. And mental health, Jen, that's an important one. I actually, um, you reminded me, mental health is actually important to all of the above. You have to be uh, having a really good mental health to have that desire to exercise, desire to eat, desire to get out there, do things. So uh, mental health is very, very important. And I, I mean, we can talk about mental health whole day long, can't we? But especially during the pandemic, pick up that phone and just call anyone. Talk, learn a new skill, get yourself a crochet set or start learning art. There's a lot of our older adults are now um, know how to operate computers. So learn a new skill, talk, read, um, communicate, nature. Get if, you, uh, if you're lucky enough to have a garden, get out there um, and breathe fresh air. It's so, so important. So mental health, should have come number one because it, it's important for everything else, isn't it? That is very true. The other thing, and it's interesting because you talked about losing weight. I lost a hundred pounds like seven years ago, and then we hit menopause, and some of it's come back. 2020 was not kind at all. I didn't put on weight, but I realized that all of my workouts were basically dog walking and bike riding. Bike riding is good. It's out in the sun. We go for a couple of hours. So it burns a lot of calories, but there was more eating. And it just so, you know, the start of this year, I realized I need to get back on the, you know, the really intense exercise and training routine I used to have, which thankfully my husband bought a Peloton and mm -hmm. I'm loving that. Mm -hmm. And so I, like I said, I did the resistance band strength training this morning and that took some brain power because I had to figure out how they were doing certain things with the bands. But one of the things that I learned during that weight loss journey, my personal trainer was 15 years older than me. Oh. So she's late sixties at this point is maintaining balance. She would always have us doing exercises that helped maintain your balance. Because if you're getting a little unsure and you fall over putting on your pants or getting up out of a chair, we all know falling is really bad for us. So there's mm. lots of things you can do to maintain your balance too, besides riding. Very around. good point, Jen. That's an excellent point because one of the age-related changes which happen to our brain, it's a furring and hardening of blood vessels. Um, over 90% of patients over the age of 80 already have a degree or burning and hardening of blood vessels of the brain. In medical terms, we call it small vessel disease. You don't even have to have strokes or transient ischemic attacks. Just that age-related change is what leading to poor balance as we age. And you are so right. Doing the balance exercises along resistance training is very, very important to maintain in our balance for longer to extend that. So one thing I've learned during this podcast, if you want to maintain your brain health, you have to eat right and exercise and get sunlight and proper sleep. No magic <laughs> pill. <laughs> uh, we can touch on some medical things, Jen. Um, I think in terms of prevention of frailty, we need to remember, especially as we get um, so I spoke about prevention of frailty maybe for people who are currently in their 50s and 60s. But if I talk about individuals who are the, in their late 60s, 70s, they are not frail yet. But talking about prevention for them, they probably already have a few medical problems. They are probably or, already on a, a number of medications. What they need to remember is as they age, the targets for various controls change the blood sugar level control changes, the blood pressure control levels change. So they have to review those medicines. The medicines, if you are on a few four or five medicines, you have to discuss them with your pharmacist or family practitioner every six months. Do you still need that dose? Do you still need this medicine? Maybe it has to be changed to something else, maybe discontinued. Maybe you need something which you are not already. Um, blood pressure, for example. People who are on blood pressure medications in their 60s, 70s, they get into their 80s and 90s. And I don't know whether you knew Jen or not, but as we grow older, the blood pressure starts going down a bit naturally. It starts reducing. But if nobody reviews your blood pressure medications, 
and you are on the same lot in your 80s as you were in your 60s, sure enough, your blood pressure will be over-treated, it will be too low, you will have dizzy spells, fall, fracture your hip, and next thing you find yourself in the nearest care room. So medicines review, constantly check the levels and uh, update your medicines. That sounds important. And since I'm not on any medications, it's not something that I th- I think of immediately. So mm. that's my first goal in life and has been a goal for ever since I was an adult. <laughs> since I was in my 30s, probably, mm. is to avoid being on medications, mm. if at all possible. And I understand the p- importance for some of them, but sometimes we can lose weight and reduce our blood pressure. We can mm. learn mindfulness yeah. to le- reduce blood pressure. After this last year, and once we're through this pandemic, because as we're recording, it is January 12th, 2021. Britain is in, I don't know, like complete lockdown. California is practically in the same boat. So we're not there yet, but we're getting closer. Science has blessed us with vaccines. We just got to get them all rolled out. Is there anything else we should discuss about frailty before we sign off today? I think we've covered most of it. I think we've covered most of it. I, uh, uh, when you were talking about reduction of blood pressure, you forgot to mention alcohol. And oh. I think in all our discussion about frailty, we somehow did not mention alcohol at all. So maybe I will squeeze it in in sure. our last couple of minutes of our discussion. And um, the point I want to make in terms of alcohol and frailty Again, guys, don't forget, as we age, liver function goes down a little bit, liver shrinks, the liver circulation slows down. So it cannot, alcohol, of course, processed by your liver. So your liver is not as good as processing your alcohol as it was in your 50s and 60s. So cut down on alcohol because drinking the same amounts will result in alcohol levels growing. So what you drank the day before still will be in your blood next day. And then you have more drink, alcoholic drink, and that's the levels will be accumulating. And you think you haven't drunk much, but actually you go driving and somebody breast tests you and your alcohol levels might be actually dangerously high. That's a good point. I drink tea and water, so that's why I don't think of alcohol. <laughs> I have enough fondness for food and sugar, which I learned 10 years ago how to reduce, that I just have made a choice not to drink most of the time because too many calories. And then I'd have to do more exercise. And mm. that interferes with my new hobby I picked up during the pandemic of making greeting cards. So I learned something new, new during the pandemic. That's what I was saying a bit earlier, learn a new skill. It will occupy you. It will uh, train your brain. And of course, uh, learning a new skill in your 50s, 60s has shown now by research to slow down or actually prevent dementia. So there you go. Yay for me. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm not sure I mentioned it to you, but my maternal great-grandmother had dementia. My maternal grandmother likely had vascular dementia from an aneurysm that leaked for three months. And my mom obviously had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So, you know, my family history is not so great. So I do, when I started the weight loss and exercise journey, it was to avoid the diabetes that is on my dad's side of the family. Mm, mm. And luckily for me, doing that also has helped prevent possible Alzheimer's. So, you know, you might not think that you like exercise or you, know, you really like that fatty, juicy steak with the butter on top, which that makes me kind of queasy because I can't, I personally cannot eat that much fat anymore. But ask yourself if this sugary treat or this fatty meat is worth potentially not being able to take care of yourself later on. Mm, true. It, it, puts, true. it puts making a healthy lifestyle into perspective. I have to exercise or I become homicidal. Hmm. I actually went to the gym way back when, during the journey, back when we could go into gyms. And I literally walked in the door, just, I got on the bike, I was pedaling. And the trainer that I told you about a minute ago came over. She was everything okay? I'm like, it will be in an hour. And we did the (laughs) class. And after an hour, it was like, okay, the world is safe. I'm not homicidal anymore. (laughs) I don't even remember what was bothering me. I just remember how I felt when I walked in 
which mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. don't get in my face because I might hurt you. And when I walked out, you know, the, the it butterflies and the birds were chirping around my head. Oh. And I was like, you know, I get the same feeling. It feels good. It I does. Totally and I get really great creative ideas when I'm exercising. So that was the mm-hmm. thing that made me realize that my exercise wasn't, you know, it wasn't up to par because it wasn't getting ideas. It's like the the blood wasn't going through the brain fast enough to get all the ideas. So, Mm. you know, just start out slow. Don't make massive changes right away. It's it's, you can do it. If I can lose a hundred pounds and keep most of it off for seven years, you guys can do it too. Jen, as I am, as I'm um, originally from Russia, I have no idea what 100 pounds means. Can you tell me what is in kilograms? <laughs> um, no. Let me think. Oh, me okay. Th- I'll, I'll do that. I'll uh, okay. translate it's later. It's a lot. It's about oh. the weight of a 10-year-old child. All right. It's wow, that is significant. Sounds like it could be about 30 kilograms. It's possible. Yeah. When I was a kid, we learned half of the metric system and half of the English system. And so I never learned either one of them very well. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I know kilograms, I know it's in, in hundreds and I think 30 is probably close. So as long as you didn't ask me in stones, cause that one, I don't know at all, <laughs> <laughs> but this has been fantastic. And Dr. Elena is going to be back monthly with other really great tidbits of information. Although this is more than a tidbit, there's a big chunk. And I really appreciate you coming have a lot today. to cover. <laughs> yeah, I know. She gave me a list and we will be back again together next month. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.